So the chapter three practice test has a bunch of problems that don't have any algebra um, and a few trick questions. And that makes it so you can lose a lot of points without making, you know, a lot of algebra mistakes. So be really careful when you're, you know, studying for the test to make sure that the problems that don't have any algebra that you completely understand because I can't really give partial credit for wrong answers so well on a problem that there's no algebra to do. Um, the first problem wants me to find the domain in the range and write it in interval notation. To do the domain, I need to know where the graph starts and stops in terms of left to right. And this graph is going to start at that point three zero. And I'm assuming it goes down and to the right forever. And in terms of left to right, it ends kind of at the right edge of the x-axis. And when I go to write the domain, I'm going to indicate the x-coordinate of the starting point and the x-coordinate at the end of the graph of the point at the end of the graph. And for this particular problem, the starting point is the point 3, 0. Its x-coordinate is 3. Because that's a point on the graph that's marked with a solid circle, it gets a square bracket. If it was a point on the graph that's marked with an open circle, it would actually get a round bracket. And then the edge of the graph, the right edge of the graph, is going to have an x-coordinate of infinity. Infinities always get round brackets because technically infinity doesn't exist. There's always a number bigger than any number you can think of. When I go to do the range, I'm looking for y's as opposed to x's, the domain is x's, the range is y's, and for the range, I have to figure out the y-coordinate of the bottom of the graph, and then the y-coordinate of the top of the graph. And this particular graph right here, I'm assuming it goes down forever and to the right, and the bottom of the graph, in terms of the y, has a y-coordinate of negative infinity. For the start of this range, I'm going to start the range at negative infinity. Infinities always get round bracket. And then the range will end at the top of the graph. And this point 3, 0, it isn't only like the start or the left edge of the graph, it's also the top of the graph. And when I go to do the range, because I want y, so I'm going to pull off the y-coordinate of that point. And points on the graph that are marked with solid circles get square brackets. So the range for this would be negative infinity to zero. Round bracket are always on the infinities. Square brackets for points that are on the graph. Two was a super, super um, common problem for students to get no credit on. Um, it asked me to find the domain in the range and it gives points that aren't connected. It's absolutely wrong to connect those points. So many students will connect the point and write a domain in a range using interval notation. When you're given a graph that's just a scattering of disconnected points, it's correct to write the domain in the range, not with round or square brackets, but with these squiggly set braces. And to do the domain, you just write down the x-coordinate of each and every point that's marked. So for this problem, because the points aren't connected, I'm just going to write the x-coordinates separate the x-coordinate of each x-point with a comma and put them in the squiggly set braces. And that would be the domain for this function. For the range, I need the y-coordinate of every point. And if I look at the points, the y's that I marked, I marked two zeros, two ones, and a two. Although I could write two zeros, two ones, and a two, it's not necessary to duplicate um, y's when you're going to write the range. So I'm just going to write one zero, one one, and one two. And I'm going to say the range is zero, one, and two. And again, separating the numbers with a comma. For question three, it gives me a fraction asks me to find the domain and write my answer in interval notation or words. And when you go to find the domain of a fraction, you ignore the numerator. So I'm going to ignore the x minus 4. And I'm going to solve the x squared plus 3x plus 2 equal to 0. 
And depending on whether I prefer interval notation to write my answer, or if I prefer writing my answer in words, the algebra there is not going to give me the domain completely. It's going to give me the key numbers for the domain. So let me solve it, what I need to do, the algebra I need to do. And then I'll write two versions of the answer. And when you go to do your test, you only need to do one of the two versions. So I ignore the numerator because fractions aren't undefined when a numerator is 0. And essentially, fractions are undefined when a denominator is equal to 0. And this is what I'm trying to do is find where the denominator or where the fraction is undefined. I'm going to factor this. And this is easy factoring. Usually when I give test questions, I try to make the factoring reasonably easy. That factors into x plus 2 times x plus 1 because I have nothing but plus signs because the problem only has plus signs. The last has to multiply to 2 and add to 3. Once I get it factored, I set each of the factors equal to 0. And I get the numbers to exclude from the domain. If on your answer to this you wrote x equal negative 2 and x equal to negative 1, that's not interval notation, it's not words, it's not even correct because you have to exclude those numbers. Let me show you how to write the interval notation and then I'll write something with words that's also correct. So you have an either or, you have two answers that are acceptable for this. To do the interval notation form of the answer, you'd create a number line, just a one dimensional number line that has negative infinity on the left edge positive infinity on the right edge. You'd put the numbers that you're excluding from the domain, negative 2 and negative 1 between the infinities, and then I'd create intervals. With all round brackets, round brackets or round parentheses exclude the numbers, and the intervals that are kind of implied by that number line are those three intervals. And so one answer to question 5, I can say the domain would be these three intervals, the interval from negative infinity to negative 2, and then separate the individual union, intervals with union symbols, the interval from negative 2 to negative 1, and the interval from negative 1 to infinity. That would be a perfect answer. That's using the domain and interval notation. And then in words, you could have done this. So an alternate answer would use words as opposed to symbols. And I could say the domain is all real numbers except and then whatever the algebra gave me negative 2 and negative 1 so these are your ors so you can do this answer which is in words or you can do this answer which is an interval notation you don't have to do them both And then if you have something else that you want to show, um, you can ask me in class if it's going to be okay. There's a shorthand that I do sometimes that I'm completely content with too. But the instructions um, ask for one or, or the other, so I gave you both of what it asked for. So 3, 4, and 5 are three questions that give me functions that ask me to find the domain. And they all solve completely differently. For fractions, you set the denominator equal to zero, you ignore the numerator, and then you need to do some work to get your answer in the appropriate form. The next problem gives me a square root, and it asks me to find the domain. To find the domain of a square root, you take the radicand, or what's under the square root, and you set it greater than or equal to zero, and solve for x. And unlike the square root, this actually gives me something that's equal to the domain. So I'm going to write the domain in words and in interval notation, although this is actually what the domain is. The algebra for a fraction, when you're going to find the do domain, doesn't really give you what the domain is. It gives you the numbers to exclude from the domain. The algebra for a square root actually gives you the, what the domain is. Now I just need to interpret this. So um, if I wanted to write my domain in words, which is one of the two choices for how I'd go to write my answer, I can say the domain is all real numbers and then that symbol is a greater than or equal to, so I'm going to write that down
so the domain is all real numbers greater than or equal to 6. The alternative is to write that in interval notation. And I just want to write an interval that has the numbers that are greater than or equal to 6. On a number line, I might do something like this for the domain. Have a 6 followed by an infinity, and then maybe put a closed circle because they are equal to, and go off to the right. That would be something that would be um, a number line approach, but that's not writing the domain in interval notation. To write the domain in interval notation, I need you know round and square brackets. I get a square bracket because they are equal to on the 6, followed by a comma, and then a round bracket by the infinity. The numbers that belong in the domain in interval notation are 6 and infinity. 6 is the first number that's equal to 6, and the rest of the numbers to the right of 6 are greater than 6. Infinity, in some sense, is the last number that's greater than 6. So this would be the domain in interval notation. When you go to do the equivalent problem on the test, um, I can live with either, and I usually, if students write, would leave your answer with an inequality, I'd give full credit for that too. 5 is a polynomial, and there's no algebra to do the find of the domain of a polynomial. I can go straight into my answer writing. The domain in words would just be the domain is all real numbers without any except. If you did algebra, you'd probably found the x-intercepts, and they don't belong in the domain. I'm asked to write the domain in my choice of words or interval notation. And all real numbers in terms of interval notation would be the interval from negative to positive infinity. I always put all three problems on all three types of algebra domain problems on a test. So I do fractions, where you ignore the numerator, set the denominator equal to zero. The algebra gives you the number to exclude from the domain, but doesn't actually give you the domain. I give you square roots, where you find the domain by setting the radicand, or what's under the radical, greater than or equal to zero. And the algebra actually gives me something that's equivalent to the domain. I can just transform that symbols into words or intervals. And then I give you a polynomial. All right, now more algebra. 6 wants me to find f minus g of x, and I'm going to give you the functions. They're not always uh, the functions that are written. To find f minus g of x, I'm going to start off, and I'm going to take this minus sign and put it in between two parentheses. In the first parentheses, I'm going to write what f of x is equal to, which is 2x plus 5. The reason I'm writing f first, because f is written before the minus sign. In the second parentheses, I'm going to write what g is equal to, which is 3x minus 1. And I'm just going to combine like terms and simplify, and that's going to give me my answer. So f minus g of x is going to be 2x plus 5. I can just drop the first parentheses without changing the 2x or the 5. The minus in front of the parenthes second parentheses is going to make the 3x a minus 3x. It's going to change the sign of the minus 1 to a plus 1. And I'm almost ready to write my answer. I just need to combine like terms. The like terms I need to combine are 2x minus 3x and plus 5 and plus 1. 2x minus 3x is minus 1x. You can write just a minus sign or you can write a minus 1 in front of the x in your answer. So if you just had a minus and not the 1 followed by the x, that would be fine. And 5 plus 1 is 6. This is my answer. To this. If you want to lose some points, it's completely wrong. It'd be like a minus 3 if you did this. If you did minus 1x plus 6 equal to 0, minus 6 from both sides and get minus 1x equal to minus 6, divide by negative 1 and get x equal to 6. If your answer to a question that had this, you know, something said find f minus g of x. If your answer was a number like that, um, 
that's not what this is asking to do. If, in order for this to be correct, it would have to say find where f minus g of x equal to zero. If the instruction said find where f minus g of x equal to zero, then this would be correct. But I'm not asking you to do this. I'm just asking you to find f minus g of x. It says nothing about setting it equal to zero. If you set it equal to zero, it's absolutely wrong. And you're going to lose probably three points. So don't take do the temptation to do more algebra than, than is required. Seven wants me to find g composed with f of x. And I know that that's the same as g of f of x, which means to take the x and the g function and, to cha and change it to f of x. So I'm going to get 3 times f of x minus 1 by just taking that x and changing it to an f of x. And now I'm going to change the f of x to 2x plus 5. So this is going to be 3 times 2x plus 5 minus 1. I'm going to clear the parentheses by going 3 times 2x, which is 6x, 3 times 5, which is 15, minus 1, and then I'm about ready to write my answer. I'm going to write the problem with my answer, but you don't have to. You can just write what I'm going to write to the right of the equal sign that I'm getting ready to write. So I'm going to bring down the 6x, now subtract 15 minus 1 and get plus 14. If you pulled out a common factor of 2 and you wrote 2 times 3x plus 7, I guess that's probably better, but I just didn't, wouldn't instinctively do that. Eight wants me to find f plus g of two, and I know that that tells me to find f of two plus g of two. Let me do those off to the side. f of two is what you get when you plug in two to the f function for x, so that's two, plus, two times two plus five that's going to be 9. Also needs me to find g of 2. And g of 2 is what you get when you plug 2 in for that x, which is 3 times 2 minus 1. That's 6 minus 1, which is 5. So f plus g of 2, which is the same as f of 2 plus g of 2, is the same as 9 plus 5, because f of 2 is 9 and g of 2 is 5. My answer is just going to be the number 14. You don't have to write the problem with your answer, but it's kind of nice to do it. But if this was a test question and all you did is wrote down 14 for your answer, I can completely live with that. Nine wants me to find a difference quotient. And in order to find a difference quotient, I need to take any of the symbols that have an f and change them to what they're equal to. So there's two symbols that have an f. There's f of x plus h and f of x. And I'm going to change those to something that doesn't have function notation. The easy thing to change is the f of x is equal to 2x minus 3. So when I started doing my different qu difference quotient, I kept the minus, I kept the fraction bar, and I kept the h. I got rid of the f of x plus h and the f of x and put parentheses where they were. In the parentheses that's holding the spot for f of x, I'm going to put 2x minus 3 because that's what f of x is equal to. And in the parentheses that holds f of x plus h, which is that parentheses, I need to figure out what to put in that parentheses. And I figure out what to put in that parentheses by changing the x in the function that's given to x plus h. So I change that x to x plus h. I clear the parentheses that I just put in by multiplying 2 times x and 2 times h. And that tells me what to put in the parentheses that's holding the spot of f of x plus h. In this parentheses, I'm supposed to put 2x plus 2h minus 3. I've technically already found the difference quotient. This is the answer. It's just not simplified. So anything I'm about to do now is just simplifying. The first parentheses, when I drop it, I don't need to change anything inside the parentheses. 
But the second parentheses, the minus is going to attach to the 2x, and it's going to flip the sign on the 3. And when I drop it, I'm going to get a minus 2x and a plus 3. Haven't done any work to the denominator. And now I'm going to start simplifying the numerator. In the numerator, the 2x and the minus 2x cancel. The minus 3 and the plus 3 cancel. So in the numerator, the only thing that doesn't cancel is the 2h. And then once I get that accomplished, the 2h, the h from the 2h cancels with the h in the denominator. And my whole answer is just going to be the number 2. And again, you don't need to write the question with the answer. If you just wrote the number 2, that would be fine. So really, you just need to write 2, but you can write the problem next to the answer. 10 wants me to find an average rate of change and of a function from x equal to 0 to x equal to 2. An average rate of change is just a slope of a line that connects two points on the graph. And what I'm going to do is create two points and find the slope between those two points. And what's given to me is the x-coordinates of the points, which are 0 and 2, and a function that helps me get the y-coordinates of the points. So for each point, I'm going to get a y. For the first point, I'm going to get its y by plugging in 0 for x into the f function. So I'm going to get 0 cubed plus 6 times 0 squared. And I know that that's equal to 0. I could do that on my calculator if I needed to, but I could just do... 0 up arrow 3 plus 6 times 0 squared, and it's going to give me 0. That's going to be the y-coordinate of the first point. And then for my second y, I'm going to plug in 2 for x and go 2 cubed plus 6 times 2 squared. I think that's 32, but let me do that real quickly. 2 cubed plus 6 times 2 squared. And I get 32. So that's my second y. The numbers that were given were the x's. What I get when I plug the numbers into the functions are y's. And then now I can say my average rate of change equals y2 minus y1, which is 32 minus 0. That's just subtracting the y's over x2 minus x1, which is 2 minus 0. This comes out to 32 over 2. And my answer, I'm just going to write the number 16 to be lazy because my video is getting ready to break right here. But I could reuse the words and say average rate of change equals to 16. But I'm content just writing 16. So 11 gives me a function f of x and wants me to sketch a graph of f of x. So for 11a, I'm going to graph f of x equals the absolute value of x. And I'm going to do that by just making a table of values. I'm going to put negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2 in the x column. And for each x, I'm going to get a y. The first y, I'm going to do f of negative 2, which is going to be the absolute value of negative 2, which is positive 2. The second y, I'm going to do f of negative 1, which is the absolute value of negative 1, which is positive 1. The third y, I'm going to do f of 0, which is the absolute value of 0, which is 0. The third, I'm going to do f of 1, which is the absolute value of 1, which is 1. And then f of 2, which is the absolute value of 2, which is 2. So now I'm going to sketch a graph of this. Uh, I think I could fit it here, I guess. I'll try. Um, so I'm going to sketch a graph right here. So I'm going to put the point negative 1, negative 2, 0, 1, and 2 on my x-axis. My y-axis only needs to go up to 2, so 0, 1, and 2. So I'm just going to plot the points and connect them, and absolute value graphs generally form a V. So here's the point, negative 2, 2, negative 1, 1, 
zero zero one one and two two so it looks something like that I should have did it in blue because my next graph I'm gonna do in red uh, so this is a graph of the absolute value of x so that's done with part a now I'm going to do part b part b is super easy I do it right here to find 4 times f of x that's just going to be 4 times the absolute value of x part c wants me to make a table and sketch a graph so for part c I'm going to do it on the same graph in red I'm going to graph 4 f of x equals 4 times the absolute value of x by making a table of values I'm going to use the same x's I'm going to use negative 2 negative 1 0 1 and 2 and then plug those numbers into this function so the first one I'm going to go 4 times the absolute value of negative 2 which is going to be 4 times 2 and that's going to be 8 for the second one, I'm going to plug negative 1 in for that x and get 4 times the absolute value of negative 1, which is going to be 4 times positive 1, which is 4. Third one, 4 times the absolute value of 0, which is 4 times 0, which is 0. Fourth one, 4 times the absolute value of 1, which is 4 times 1, which is 4. And then 4 times the absolute value of 2, which is 4 times 2, which is 8. So now I need to plot these points, and this is really unfortunate because I need to get up to 8. So here's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then 8. Now I'm going to sketch a graph. So I made my table of values. I'm going to sketch a graph and the best I can here. So the point negative 2, 8 is about there, and then this sh yeah I can barely read that that's the point negative one four the point zero zero the point one four and then the point two eight so this graph looks something like that so I found four f of x right in here did that on the same graph. And now I'm going to describe the transformation. I'm just going to say that the red graph is narrower than the wide graph. Um, we could say something about a horizontal shift or a vertical shift. For part D, I'm just going to say it's narrower. I think that's more descriptive and it's easier. An easy explanation that I think is adequate. So I'm going to say the graph of 4 times f of x is narrower than the graph of f of x. So the next groups are the, all the shifting things, and we have to remember that f of x plus h shifts the graph left, f of x minus h shifts the graph right, and I don't know why I'm going to use a different letter, but f of x plus k moves the graph up, f of x minus k shifts the graph down negative f of x reflects over the x-axis and f of negative x reflects over the y-axis. So these you have to have on your note card or memorize. We do those all, this a lot this semester. It comes up in two more chapters. So the first problem wants me to find f of x plus 3 when f of x is equal to x squared. My answer to part a is going to be super easy. For 12a, f of x plus 3 is what I get when I change that x inside of parentheses to an x plus 3. Done with part a, I move on to part b. I could say f of x plus 3 has the same shape as f of f x equals x squared, but it's shifted left 3 units. I'm going to be lazy, and to describe the transformation, I'm just going to say it's shifted left 3 because the plus is in a parenthesis it moves it left. For part th question 13, to find f of x plus 4, because that plus 4 is not in a parenthesis, I'm not going to see any parentheses in the problem, and the plus 4 is just going to go after the x squared. 
for 13b to describe the transformation if you add a number and it's not inside the function notation it shifts it up so I'm just gonna say the graph was shifted up for 14a I'm gonna need to see a parentheses because the f of x minus 2 part that has the parentheses and there's gonna be a number after the function because of that minus 3 f of x minus 2 minus 3 the x minus 2 part is going to give me x minus 2 quantity squared in a parentheses. The minus 3 is going to come after the function because it's not inside the parentheses. That would be the answer to part A. And when I go to do part B, the minus inside the parentheses shifts it right. So I'm going to say it's going to be moved right to, and then the minus after the function moves it down, and it's going to go down 3. That's all that I would do for problems 12, 13, and 14. There's a 15, 16, and 17, so this should really say 12 through 17, that ask me to do the same things, and so let me do that. For 15a, I need to find f of x plus 2 minus 3. The plus 2 is in a parentheses, so I'm going to get an x plus 2 in a parentheses for that, a square outside the parentheses because the function I'm transforming is x squared, and then the minus 3 would go afterwards. For part b, the plus inside the parentheses moves it left, the minus after the, per the function moves it down. So for part b, I'm going to say it goes left 2 and down 3. For 16, the negative goes in front of the x squared because the negative is in front of the f of x. So for 16a, negative f of x is going to be negative x squared, or if you want to, you can write it as negative 1x squared. But it shouldn't be inside of parentheses because the x, the negative is not inside of parentheses. And this kind of shifting reflects the graph over the x-axis. So my explanation for 16 is going to be reflect over the x-axis. For 17a, I'm asked to find f of negative x, and because that negative's inside the parentheses, it needs to go inside the parentheses. Although that's a correct answer, it's not the best answer, because negative x squared is the same as negative x times negative x, and when you multiply two negatives, you get a positive, and you multiply two x's, you get an x squared. So for 17a, I'd probably say f of negative x equals to x squared. I would absolutely live with that if you left it there, but if you took the time to, to, re to simplify it, that would be fine too. In terms of the reflection, if you put a negative inside a parentheses, that's going to reflect the graph over the y-axis. And for 17b, I'm just going to say it's reflected over the y-axis. The reason it comes out to the original problem is because the graph is naturally symmetric to the y-axis and that's why it reduces to the same function. Alright, now another big chunk of problems without any algebra. I don't know how well these points show up but I will do, do your best, I'll do my best to point them out. For 18 it asks for x-intercepts and to find x-intercepts, I look across the x-axis, and any point that's marked on the x-axis is considered an x-intercept. There's two points marked on the x-axis, and if you can read them, it says negative 1, 0, and positive 3, 0. So the x-intercepts for, for problem 18 are negative 1, 0, and positive 3, 0. 19 wants the y-intercept. To find a y-intercept, I go across up and down the y-axis, and any point on the y-axis is a y-intercept. It's hard to read, but that point right there is the point zero, 03. So x-axis, points on the x-axis give you x-intercepts, points on the y-axis give you y-intercepts. Question 20 says, for what values of x is h of x equal to 4? This is asking me to find the x-coordinate for any point that has 4 for its y-coordinate. 
And problem 20 is calling out that point because that's the only point on the graph that has a 4 for the y coordinate. My answer to problem 20, I'm just going to write x equal to 1 because the x coordinate of that point is 1. Problem 21 wants me to find h of 4, and problem 21 wants me to find the y coordinate of any point that has an x coordinate. of 4. And the point problem 21 is calling out is that point 4, negative 5. I'm going to write my answer in a few different ways. I can just write the number negative 5. If I want to, I can write y equal negative 5. Or I can say h of 4 equal negative 5. Any one of these answers, as long as you had the negative 5 and you didn't say x equal to negative 5, because that negative 5 is a y, would be OK. 22 wants me to find the domain of this function. To find the domain of this function, I need to extend it in the direction that it's going. And in terms of the x-axis, I need to find the left edge and the right edge. This graph goes all the way down and to the left forever. And kind of the start of the graph, if I'm drawing it, I'd start this way, is this point right here that has an x-coordinate of negative infinity. And then this point down here is kind of the end of the graph, and it's going to go all the way to the far right edge of the x-axis. The end of the graph is going to have an x-coordinate of positive infinity. When I go to write the domain of this, I'm going to say the domain is between negative and positive infinity. For the range, I have to find the bottom of the graph and its y-coordinate. And this graph, the bottom is down here somewhere, and the bottom in terms of y, has a y-coordinate of negative infinity. And I have to find the top of the graph, and this, the vertex is the top of the graph, and I need its y-coordinate in the range, because the ranges are y's, and I go from bottom to top. The range for this is going to be negative infinity, which is the y-coordinate of the bottom of the graph, to positive 4, which is the y-coordinate of the point at the top of the graph. Infinities always get round brackets. Points on the graph, if they're marked with closed circles, get square brackets. Twenty four through twenty nine wants me to find um, where the graph is increasing and decreasing, maximums and minimums. To do twenty four to figure out where the graph is increasing, I'm going to create on my x axis some intervals. I'm going to start off by putting the infinities on my x axis along with the x coordinate of any turning point. There's a turning point or a maximum point at the point negative one four and there's a turning point at 1, 0. In order to gear up to answer 24 where the graph is increasing and 25 where the graph is de decreasing, I'm going to create the intervals that are implied by these numbers. Increasing and decreasing are always all round brackets. So it's going to be negative infinity to negative 1, negative 1 to 1, and 1 to infinity are the intervals that are implied by the numbers I put on the number line. In the first interval that support this is the region of the graph that applies to um, that it refers to and that region of the graph as I'm moving from left to right the graph is getting higher this I'm going to call an increasing interval because in that region or in that segment of the graph as I move from left to right the graph is getting higher the portion of the graph that corresponds to the interval between negative 1 to 1 is this little interval that I tried to point to and as I move from left to right, that graph is getting lower. So in that region, I'm going to say the graph is decreasing. The portion of the graph that corresponds to the 1 to infinity is this region here that goes from the turning point to the end of the graph. And that graph, as I'm moving from left to right, is also getting higher, like the first interval. That's going to be an increasing interval as well. So when I go to write my answers to 24 and 25, 
the increasing intervals, the intervals where the graph is getting higher as I move from left to right are going to go in 24, and the one decreasing interval, the interval that my graph is getting lower as I move from left to right is going to go in 25. So the increasing intervals are going to be the interval from negative infinity to negative 1, and the interval from 1 to infinity. Usually if you're writing interval notation and you have a couple intervals, you separate the intervals by a union sign. And then the middle interval is the decreasing interval and it goes for problem 25. That's it for 24 and 25, no algebra there. 26, 27, 28, and 29 just want me to realize um, what point is the maximum point and what's the minimum point. This point, negative one-fourth, actually in a calculus we call it a relative maximum, meaning it's a high point that's close, that's higher than anything close to it, but not actually the highest point on the graph. And this point one zero, because it's kind of at a little bottom, essentially of a parabola shape, we'd call it a minimum point. In calculus, we'd call it a relative minimum. So humps that are, you know, at a top are maximums, humps are valleys that are at a bottom are a minimum. So I know what the maximum and the minimum point are. 26 wants me to find the x coordinate of the local maximum, local and relative are equal words, so I could have called this local. Just was just doing a calculus video, so I'm used to saying relative. And the x-coordinate of that point is x equal to negative 1. And then 27 wants the local maximum value, and that's just the y-coordinate of that point, which is going to be y equal to 4. 28 wants the x-coordinate of the local minimum. The x-coordinate of that point is x equal to 1. 29 wants the local minimum value, which is the y-coordinate of the minimum, which is y equal to 0. Last problem, and I ask the same question in calculus exactly like this, other than we solve it with calculus. So we have a campground owner has a thousand meters of fencing. He's going to enclose a rectangular region. So he's going to do something like this. He's going to build three sides of fencing, and the fourth side of fence is along a river. So this is what the farmer's going to take his thousand meters of fencing, and he's going to build three sides of fence and use a river kind of as the fourth side. And I'm supposed to, from my diagram, let W be the width of the field. I'm going to let make this be these two be Ws. And I'm going to let L be the length of the field then. Now I need to write an equation for the length of the field. The farmer's building one length and two widths with a thousand meters of fencing. So I'm going to take the one length that the farmer's building plus the two widths that the farmer's building. And that's going to equal its thousand, his thousand meters of fencing. I'm going to solve it for L to get my answer to question A of number 30. So my answer, an equation for the length of the field is going to be length equals minus 2w plus 1,000. B wants me to write an equation for the area of the field that's being made. And even though the farmer's building three sides, what he's going to get is a rectangular region that has a length and a width. And the area of any rectangular region is just the length times the width. For this farmer, his length can be found by taking 2w plus 1,000. So for this field, the length times the width can be improved upon because the length is negative 2w plus 1,000. The answer to part b is what I'm going to get when I clear this parentheses. I'm going to say a for area equals, then I'm going to multiply negative 2w times w, which is negative 2w squared, and then 1,000 times w and get plus 1,000w. To do part c, to find the optimum width, the farmer wants to get the biggest area possible um, with 1,000 meters of fencing. And in order to do this, to find the w that gives me the maximum area, I'm going to use the negative b over 2a part of the quadratic formula to get the vertex of the parabola that, that's defined here. If I was to graph this equation, it's going to graph to a parabola. 
and that parabola is going to open down. It's going to look something like this. Every point on the graph, the x coordinate is a width, the y coordinate is the area. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find the x coordinate of the vertex because that width gives the highest area because the area is a maximum point. And to get the x coordinate, I'm going to use the negative b over 2a formula. And that's going to be my a from the formula. This is going to be my b from the formula because those are parts of the quadratic formula. The a is the number in front of the squared term. And the b is the number in front of the first power term. So I'm going to write the width equals negative b, which is going to be negative 1,000 over 2 times a, which is 2 times negative 2, which is negative 1,000 over negative 4. And my answer is going to be the width, because that's what I'm finding here, the width. And that divides to 250, positive, and the, an the units are going to be meters. D wants me to find the length. For the length, I'm going to use the formula. Length is minus 2w plus 1,000. That's going to give me length equals minus 2 times 250 plus 1,000. That's going to be 500. Let me do it real quickly. So negative 2 times 250 plus 1,000 and I, plus 1,000, and you get 500. So part of the answer to this is going to be the length is 500 meters. And then this is a rectangle. I know how to find its area. Its area is just its length times its width. So its area is going to be 500 meters, which is the length, times 250 meters, which is the width. When I go to write my answer, I'm going to write the area, and then whatever 500 times 250 happens to be 125,000. And area always has square units. When I found the area here, I multiplied meters by meters and got square meters. So that's everything we need for the test. If you can just perfect these 30 problems, you should be perfectly fine on our test.